welcome to uh, a little description of some of the assumptions that we're going to be using when we talk about time value of money in this class. Um, I have to point out these assumptions are very, very, very simplified. Um, if you want to learn a lot more about time value of money and the actual assumptions and actions of human beings, um, please go ahead and consider taking my behavioral economics course. Uh, I think the next time that should be around will be in the winter. Um, these are verbal statements that are actually um, equivalent to the, the math that's behind it. And the math is just something along the line that the valuation function is linear and additively separable across time. But let's go ahead and talk about what these mean. And please note that each one of these is easily and demonstrably false. But we're just going to go ahead and continue to make the assumptions simply because it makes the math nice. And it also makes these um, kind of problems uh, look more like the financial valuations instead of the ones that have to do with our own appreciations of time. Now the first one up there is that costs and benefits of equal size have equal value in all periods. And this means that if you get um, $100 uh, today, and you can picture the happiness that you get because of it, yeah, I could give it to you, the $100, on any other day. And on that day, when you receive the money, you'll be just as happy to receive it then. Well, this is obviously not true. Um, you can picture receiving the $100 on the day that your house is burned down, your dog has died, you're really not sure you know, where you're going to have uh, sleep tonight or what you're going to eat. Receiving $100 on that day will have a greater benefit to your well-being and will probably cheer you up quite a bit more than receiving an additional $100 on the day that you like won the Powerball and just found out that you're worth $120 million, something along those lines. You would hardly notice the $100 on that day. You would see no increase in how your, um, your um, feelings about that particular day are. And so this one's not true. And the fact is, is that in real life, we tend to look at those wealth levels rather than just the additions to the wealth that's there. So in the real world, outside of what we're going to be doing in this class, you'll often be looking at the overall levels, how the particular investment interacts with the other investments that you already have. However, a simplifying assumption like this allows us to look at individual investments in isolation without always have to consider basically those portfolio effects, how they interact with the other things that you've done. Now, the second assumption is also going to be one which is you know, demonstrably false, but we're going to go ahead and assume it anyway. Now, this says that the value of costs and benefits are independent of costs and benefits in equal periods. Now, what you're saying here is that it doesn't matter if you received $100 yesterday. Having $100 today is going to make you just as happy as it was yesterday. Well, think about some of the things that you've done in your life. In particular, I want to go ahead and point out that there is a beverage called alcohol, and you have drunk it at some point in time. Think about the day after you have overindulged in a little bit of alcohol. You wake up the next morning with a hangover, and if somebody goes ahead and puts a drink that you would have gladly taken 12 hours before right in front of you, you're unlikely to want to have it there. And so what you have there is something like a hangover. Well, you can also have consumption hangovers. You can go ahead and decide that you spent too much the day before and that you really don't want to spend any money today, so it's not palatable to you. And so here's what we're talking about breaking the independence. In real life, how we feel about consumption one day really does depend upon what kind of consumption we had the other day. And what we're saying is, is that we can have these be nice and independent. We don't have to worry about having constantly increasing streams of benefits, which is something we prefer to constant or decreasing ones. So again, another assumption we'll be making about independence that is also demonstrably false. Third assumption we're going to be making, and again also false, is that benefits are uh, the exact opposite of costs. And the idea is that we can net them out. And so what we're saying is, is that suppose you run a hot dog stand and you had $1,000 worth of revenue and you had $700 worth of expenses, you know that you can look at just that gap between the two of it, the $300, and say, ah, this is what I've gained. Well, 
in the gut reactions that we really do have to gains and losses, we do treat them differently. We do put them in different categories. And if you ever doubt this, consider some of the crazy things that you've done to get out of you know, parking tickets or something along those lines. I am probably one of the most guilty that you will ever have at this. I one time received a parking ticket because I purchased a ticket, pulled out the ticket, and found it was for some crazy date like you know, November 35th. Well, I did the math, and it turned out that the ticket was for the right day if you, you know, march November forward or a couple more days, but I still receive a $15 ticket. Now, I called them up after I received my ticket and uh, worked for over eight hours to try to make sure that this would never happen again. I spent an amazing amount of time to get out of $15 worth of damage, and I think that you guys have probably done something similar. You have gone ahead and you know been on hold in order to go ahead and save $5 on a bill someplace, whereas the same amount of effort would have gotten you a lot more out in the market. So all we're saying here is that we're treating everything quite financially, like you would a cash box. What you're doing is taking your benefits, subtracting off your expenses, and only considering the net that's there in the middle. And that's what that third assumption is really about. And again, if you want to take a behavioral economics course, you'll really find out that we do treat benefits and costs much differently than um, we do in this particular class. And the final assumption, you know on the face of it that that's just a little bit crazy. We are going to assume continuously that all those costs and benefits that are hiding out there in the future that we know absolutely precisely, even if they're 20 years in the future. And this is clearly not true, but it's an assumption that makes things quite simple. Because having uncertainty about future values requires some math that's way beyond the uh, prerequisites for this course. And it's actually what makes things quite complicated. So I will go ahead and uh, pass you on to the next podcast.